but uh, if you don't mind, we, we can start. Welcome everyone to this week's Central Research Webinar, where we have the pleasure of receiving Jaroslav Borovishka, uh, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Economics at New York University. Jaroslav lab previously worked at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago while he was uh, pursuing his PhD in the University of Chicago in the Department of Economics and the Buddha School of Business, uh, where he got a PhD in financial economics. And he has previous training in economics and computer science in different institutions in uh, the Czech Republic. His fields of specialization are as a price in macroeconomics Time series econometrics and computational economics. And some of his publications include uh, the paper that he's going to present today, examining macroeconomic models through the lens of asset pricing, also rise, uh, risk price dynamics and banking efficiency and foreign ownership in transition. Is there evidence of a cream scheming effect? Uh, also, some of his work in progress include and also on survival and long-run dynamics with uh, heterogeneous beliefs under recursive preferences and robust preference, uh, preference expansions. And work in progress include uh, optimal policies with robust concerns, pricing rare events, and shock elasticities and input responses. He has uh, been many presentations uh, in uh, universities. I had to work a lot uh, in service, uh, referring in, in many important journals. So without further ado, let me let uh, Jared, Jared to start his presentation. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Alberto, and uh, hello, everybody. So today I'll talk about uh, this paper examining macroeconomic models through the lens of asset pricing uh, that we wrote with Lars Hansen, and it was published in Journal of Econometrics recently. So what we want to do in this paper is we want to bring closer uh, the methods used in two parallel literatures uh, in macrofinance and use them to study the asset pricing implications of uh, macrofinance models. So when you think about these two streams of literature, what I have in mind is, on the one side we have uh, the literature uh, in macroeconomics, uh, which studies dynamic general equilibrium models, which are typically structural models with many state variables, many shocks, uh, and these models are designed to match uh, typically quantity dynamics, both all, both the transient one as the as the uh, as the implications uh, over long horizons, the permanent uh, the per, uh, the implications of permanent shocks, and the methods that we use in this literature uh, include uh, the study uh, uh, of impulse response functions and targeting specific moments like correlations uh, in the uh, at the business cycle uh, at the business cycle level. On the other hand, we have the asset pricing literature, which proceeds in quite a different way in terms of the analysis. So typically those are models which have uh, few state variables and few shocks. Uh, and what we are looking at are the implications for the price dynamics for the asset prices. And the reason why we have few shocks in, this, uh, uh, in these asset pricing models is that we need to capture the nonlinearities in order to be able to compute compensations for risk and to compute expected returns on, on alternative assets and, and the associated risk premium. So while the macroeconomic literature very much focuses on some stationary dynamics around the deterministic steady state, uh, often that we can approximate using perturbation methods, the asset pricing literature uh, proceeds uh, in a much more nonlinear way. And so what we want to do is here is we want to focus on the asset pricing side of these macroeconomic models. And in order to do that, we want to study uh, the pricing implications of these models for cash flows with different maturities. So these are types of cash flows that people are very familiar with uh, are, uh, is the pricing of zero coupon bonds, right? That yields the yield curve. Uh, 
but we can but recently the uh, the empirical literature studied uh, implications for uh, cash flows uh, that are risky and that mature different horizons so, so the typical uh, object here would be the study of a, of uh, of the pricing for a, uh, of a dividend strip right so what are these dividend strips so think about uh, the s p 500 index right as a collection of stocks and these stocks yield dividends at, uh, at, in alternative quarters. And so what you can write, you can write contracts <coughs> on the payout uh, from this portfolio of stocks on these
uh, the Some of these individuals in the summit. Get the stock. Right. This in uh, 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 the this in integration of, of the star Allow stand back. Applications for cash uh, 
flows that make you were saying in one or longer study that. on these alternative investment horizon. Think about two things. When you compute risk free, yeah, are a composite. Quantity in this And then the uh, uh, the reward part so we this compensation for uh, for it. to 
cluster. And here we introduce uh, Okay. And in particular, we Types of the stroke elasticity. So first, the what we call the shock exp. Expected payoffs to current shock. Okay, so imagine a economic model is hit. We want to study how the it payoffs. Uh, associated with these dividends. We're all gonna change. in response to this shock. Okay. It's expected to fail. And this sensitivity it tells you something about the quantity of risk embedded in these payoffs. Okay. The second shock elasticity that we construct will be so-called shock price elasticity. 
and the shock price elasticity will measure the sensitivity of expected returns to these shocks. Okay? So that's the pricing implication. How much compensation does an investor require in order to hold okay, one unit more of this risk embedded, uh, embedded uh, in these cash flows? And I'll show you that these methods okay, are the nonlinear counterparts to the very familiar log linearization methods that, uh, that, that, that people use in asset pricing. Okay. So, so this paper builds on some previous work that we have with, with Lars Hansen. this but now I want to In this okay. So what do we do with these shock elastic? So I will be very special. shock elasticity. This and what does they automatically mean? Economic model. But what do we want to achieve with this? Well. I don't want to convince you that this shock elasticity.
So in particular, what I have in mind. Show you that. When we take the payoff. That is a very complicated these That that uh, so that's a part particle. instrument that we can apply. Think about the dividends. Strip that. Mature. Uh, say ten quarters in the future. Okay. So when we, we want to compute the expected return on this uh, on this dividend strip, okay, we we need to take into account the the shocks that hit the economy between today and the maturity of the asset. Right. So it's a complicated. The expected return is a complicated nonlinear function of all these shocks that hit the hit the economy between today and the maturity of the asset. So what we want to argue is that these shock elasticities capture the sensitivity, the sensitivity with respect to one particular shock. And then we can decompose the expected returns, these complicated nonlinear functions, into the contribution of individual shocks that will be measured by these shock elasticities. I will show you that mathematically these shock elasticities 
are nonlinear counterparts to what we know as impulse response functions in the macroeconomic literature. Okay? So impulse response functions in macroeconomic literature are typically thought of as, as very because we typically work uh, in, in, in macroeconomic dynamics with linearizations of models. Think about like DSG models people write down. Okay? When the world or the model is nonlinear, these impulse response functions will be much less trivial yeah, and will depend on many more things. And so I will, on, I will show you the mathematical link to these impulse, resp to these impulse response functions. Okay? So in our framework, we want to take into account some aspect that, that people in the macroeconomic literature often ignore, uh, like nonlinearity, okay? long run growth and long run discounting. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we will focus uh, at these alternative payoff horizons. Ultimately, this shock elasticity will give you the, the pricing of risk counterpart to the yield curve. Yield curve. The term structure of for holding the zero coupon bond This term structure of Will be the risk pricing count. So how does the price of 
nothing of red. Differ. cash flow so that is the term In this paper, I will work this time. Second order uh, um, quadratic exponential. That actually delegates all these sort of statistics that we can uh, that we construct. Okay. In our in our other work, we work with continuous time model. Uh, uh, we also have Extension that that in involve not standard preferences. Approximation. Uh, 
As I mentioned in this paper, we will focus on this. I announced that one of the one benefit of the This is how this is close form solutions for. benefit Is actually think it's very. Link uh, very closely. For those of you who work with okay, so this is the Uh, toolbox for solving the uh, uh, dynamic study. We actually have two boxes where
more of two dimer. Take the output. that computes all the shock uh, that you need uh, that should help you understand the asset Uh, of the model. Okay. Only very much. modifications of the model file of the people right we have We have examples of how So the dynamic application allow you to go uh, uh, and
compute this shock up. Very easy. This is what I want to do today. Uh, the minute that I have. So, first, I will start with a very simple example. Okay, so this example will be a, uh, a macroeconomic model of Icro Chan Lee. Okay. This model is not ours. I will only use it as a laboratory to show you what we can actually do with the shock elasticity. Okay. Uh, once I introduce this model, this is just just to organize ideas. Okay. I will start with the main uh, uh, with the main core of the talk. So first, I will think about a completely static economy. So I will just think about one period pricing, and I will show you how to construct these shock elasticities in just a one period model. Of course, the main benefit of all this will be to extend this pricing to multiple horizons. Okay? So then I show you how very easily uh, to construct these shock elasticities over multiple periods. And then I'll briefly talk about And mine. be just very, very brief because And then
and to this paper. model by I micro channel the solar exactly how So, Alice, please. Yeah, so, I shall ask this. Can be computed. And one day, actually, here in terms of How the model behave in terms of a So this, so this is the outline. Start with the yeah, crochet So the
gist of the record Yes. So right now, on a model. the so called value Value premium in the asset pricing. Well, it's the observation that when you sort firms, if they in the US S&P 500 or in the uh, uh, universe of uh, US uh, traded firms, okay, publicly traded firms, okay, then firms which are high book to market, okay, which have high book value relative to their market value, okay, these are called value stocks. Okay, so these stocks. These firms have high expected returns relative to the low book to market firms, which are called the growth stocks. Okay. What would be uh, a low book to market firm? Well, it would be a firm that has a mar high market valuation relative to, to the book value of their uh, of uh, uh, of its assets okay, or of its capital. Okay. So. This observation is very, and importantly, these differences in expected returns cannot be explained by just exposure to the market risk. Okay, so they cannot be explained by CAPM. Okay. This observation is very old, it goes back to at least the 1990s by the work by Farm and Friend. Okay. And there have been tons of propositions that, that, uh, uh, or that uh, there are tons of papers that propose solutions uh, to this question. Okay. So one, uh, proposition is that it has to do something with intangible risk. Okay? It has to do something with the risk embedded in intangible capital. So that's the capital that that's not accounted for just by counting physical capital. Right? So Icroce and Lee propose such a paper. And in this paper, okay, there will be two types of capital. There will be physical capital and intangible capital. Okay? And firms will differ in, in, in the composition uh, of their total capital okay, uh, and how their total capital is composed uh, of physical and intangible capital. So in particular, growth firms will be the firms that have more intangible capital okay, than, than the value firm. Okay. So think about Google as having tons of intangible capital. Okay. This intangible capital will be source of new investment projects. So using intangible capital, you can also generate new physical capital. Okay. The trick in this paper will be that intangible capital is less risky than, than physical capital. And it's less risky in this model in a very specific way that will be important. Okay. So overall, growth firms, which have more of this intangible capital, will be less risky okay, and thus earn low expected return. And this will explain the, val uh, the, the value premium. Okay. So how does the model look like? Okay. It's, so it's just a couple of equations. Okay. So total output in this economy, Y, is produced using capital, okay, K, and labor, N, 
Okay. And there is a technology uh, augmenting shock or a productivity shock A. And I will be specific about how this uh, uh, how this shock is actually modeled. Okay. And total output Y is just divided between consumption, investment into physical capital, and in investment into intangible capital. Okay. And labor is just normalized uh, to one. So, so this is just the standard Cobb Douglas production function. Then we need two accumulation equations. So first, the accumulation equation for physical capital, the capital in new period, E plus one, is just the, uh, the non-depreciated capital uh, KT, okay? Okay. KT times one minus depreciation, okay? plus newly produced physical capital. And this newly produced physical capital G, uh, is, is produced using this function G, which composes investment and the stock of intangible capital, K star. Okay? And this production technology of new capital is shocked again by another shock, BT plus one, okay? that you can think about as the investment augmenting productivity shock. Okay? Similarly, we have an accumulation equation for intangible capital, K, K star. Again, that's uh, the old stock of intangible capital, net of depreciation, okay? plus whatever is uh, uh, whatever the production of new intangible capital is. So there's the investment into intangible capital, and uh, also what you need to produce new intangible capital is the stock of tangible capital. Okay, so this is just two, these are just two accumulation equations. These two, okay, and these functions g and h are just some CES uh, uh, functions. Uh, in order to get smooth responses. So, so these CES functions serves as capital ad adjustment cost. Okay. So that's the production side. On the household side, households are endowed with these Epstein-Zinn recursive preferences. Why these non-standard preferences? Well, in order to magnify the, uh, uh, the, uh, the implications for asset prices. Okay. So here, how do, how do these Epstein-Zinn preferences look like? Well, the continuation value that the agent uses to rank different consumption streams okay, is given by a composite of consumption today, C, and the expected risk-adjusted continuation value tomorrow. Okay. So there are a couple of parameters in this. Uh, so this is just a standard continuation value recursion. It's just nonlinear here in this example. There are a couple of parameters, the parameter gamma is what can be interpreted as, as risk aversion. Okay, so that's the aver that puts some curvature on the continuation value tomorrow. Okay, and uh, the parameter psi here serves as the CES elasticity between consumption today and the, this risk-adjusted continuation value tomorrow. So, so psi appears here and here, and in order to get something homogeneous degree one, you undo this here. Okay. So psi is interpreted as the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. When the risk aversion is equal to the inverse of the intertemporal elasticity of substitution, okay, this recursion becomes linear, and we are back to separable CRRA preference. These preferences imply a stochastic discount factor. And we know from asset pricing that the stochastic discount factor is the object that determines all asset pricing implications. So if we have the stochastic discount factor, okay, we get all the asset pricing implications also. Okay. The question is how to summarize the information in this equilibrium object, in this stochastic discount factor, in a tractable way. And this is what we all try to do. Okay. So what do we have here? Here, ST plus one over ST is the one period stochastic discount factor. So that serves for, for the one period pricing. What is it composed of here? Uh, is the time preference coefficient, beta. Okay. And then there is consumption growth, CT plus one over CT, to the power of minus one over psi. So that's the inverse of intertemporal elasticity of substitution. Okay. And then there is a third term okay, that involves the continuation value tomorrow divided by the risk adjusted continuation value tomorrow. Notice that when risk aversion is equal to the inverse of intertemporal elasticity of substitution, this exponent is equal to zero. So this last parenthesis, Okay, disappears. And you are back to only separable preferences of the CRRA type, where this is just the minus risk aversion. So this is all familiar. This term is the term uh, that makes the stochastic discount factor really volatile. Why? Because 
the continuation value tomorrow will move a lot around. Okay? And we know that a volatile stochastic discount factor is necessary in order to, ge uh, in order to generate the dispersion in, in risk premia that we observe in the economy. So, so this is just an explanation of the stochastic discount factor. In order to close the model, okay, we need to describe how these exogenous shocks A and B behave. And this is now really crucial. Okay. So the technology shock, this, tech, uh, this shock A, when I go back to the specification, so, so this is this technology shock A. Okay. Remember, B is the investment augmenting uh, shock. Okay. So the technology shock okay, is modeled as a shock with a permanent component. So in particular, we model the growth rate, log AT plus one minus log AT, okay, as being influenced by two contributions. First, there is this IAD shock W1. Okay, so think about it as a normally distributed shock. Okay, uh, okay so, uh, 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 and I, and I no noted the, uh, the, uh, the question from, from the chat. Let me return it uh, to the question from the chat as soon as I describe this model. Okay. So, uh, so when we, uh, uh, so, so this technology shock is modeled as, as having a permanent component, meaning that we model the growth rate as stationary. So the stationary growth rate here composes of a direct shock, W1. Okay, so, so think about W1 as a normally distributed shock. Okay, and another shock, ZT. And this ZT okay, is modeled as an AR1. Okay. okay, so ZT plus one equals delta. So this is not the difference, this is just a parameter delta. So, so this is just an AR1 process that is shocked by another shock, W2. Okay. So now when you think about what happens to the growth rate of technology, if, if the technology is grow, hit by this shock W1, okay, the level shifts up okay, by W1 or by gamma times W1, but nothing else happens as we go forward. Okay. When the technology is shocked okay, by the shock W2, okay, then this Z process becomes elevated for a longer period of time. Okay. So that contributes for a longer period of time through these increments in ZT, not only ZT today, but also our future ZT. Okay. So this is why this shock, this W2, is sometimes called the long-run risk shock. And this gave birth to the long-run risk literature in asset pricing. Okay. So this is the specification of this A shock. How is B shock model? Uh, the B shock, when you think about the, the literature from macro on like the investment specific shocks, right? In that literature, this B shock would be modeled as independent of this A shock. Okay, so those would be two different shocks. Okay? Here it's different. Okay? Here the level of B is modeled as being exposed to the same ZT plus gamma times W1 shock as the growth rate of, of AT. Okay? with a negative coefficient. Okay. What does it mean? Well, imagine you get a negative productivity shock. This, these last two terms became, become temporarily negative. Okay. Well, that means that this B shock, because of this minus sign, okay, receives a positive increment. Okay. Well, the interpretation of this is that when the economy is hit by a negative technology shock, the productivity of a new investment in this B is temporarily insulated from, 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 uh, from this productivity shock. So new investment okay, serves as a hedge against this, this technology shock A. And this will become really important as we go. Okay. So, so, so remember that, and that, uh, this now completes the description of this model that I have in mind. Okay. So now going back to Alberto's question, is there evidence about uh, uh, the assumption of growth firms being less risky. Yes, and there is tons of it. And this gave, this gave birth exactly uh, to this very large, large literature on, on factor models as, uh, initiated by Pharma and French. So when you think about the Pharma and French uh, three factor model, okay, in that model there are three sources of reduced form risk. Okay? And these three sources of reduced form risk are embedded in these three portfolios that Fama and French construct. The market portfolio, okay, then the value minus growth portfolio, okay, and then finally the small minus big portfolio. 
Okay, so HMB and SM, uh, uh, sorry, HML uh, and SMB portfolios in the language of asset prices. Okay, and there is clear evidence. Okay, that the the value stocks and and the growth stocks differ quite a lot in terms of their exposure to this HML factor, to this uh, to this factor that's proxied for by uh, this return on this HML portfolio. Okay? So there is clear, clear, uh, uh, there are clear heterogeneous loadings on this factor. It turns out this this factor is priced, or at least this is what the, what this literature claims. Okay? And the implication, the joint implication of the fact that this factor is priced, okay, and that these firms are heterogeneously exposed to uh, to this factor means that there is also heterogeneous exposure to this risk that is priced and creates the dispersion in expected return. So this is just to Alberto's question. Okay, so now let me go uh, to uh, to what we want to do now. So essentially, the first half of the slide is. Uh, it, it, uh, so, so uh, the first half of the slide is exactly what I described on the previous uh, on, on the previous uh, uh, on the previous slide already. So Alberto now asked whether we should think about the B shocks as the uh, Justiniano Primicieri and Tambalotti mar marginal efficiency of investment shocks. Well, the macroeconomist in us would probably like to, but remember what I mentioned. The literature that Justiniano and Primicieri and Tambalotti contributed to treats this marginal efficiency of investment shocks as independent from the overall technological progress. Right? So you have the neutral technology shock, and you have the marginal eff uh, efficiency of investment shock, and they are modeled as independent. Right? Here, they are actually dependent in a very strong way. Right? So both of these, a, both A and B, okay, A and B, are impacted by the same fundamental innovation. Okay? In a different way, right, A is affected in the growth rate, B is affected in the level, okay? but this striking correlation that is built into the model will exactly generate the asset pricing implications that the authors get in that paper. And I will use the Chocolat studies to actually elaborate on that. So I actually personally don't like to think about these B shocks as the marginal efficiency of investment shocks because I think about those shocks, the Justiniano Primicieri and Tambalotti ones, as independent sources of, of risk. Okay, here it's very dependent. Okay. So now that we have described this, uh, uh, this, uh, these sources of risk, what do we want to do? Or what is our ultimate goal? Okay. So what we want to do is we want to use this shock elasticity okay, to understand first the sources of risk premia. Okay. So, so we, uh, we want to understand what generates the heterogeneity in the, uh, in the uh, in the expected return. Okay. We want to understand which shocks in this literature, uh, get, uh, in this model, get priced. Is it this W1 innovation or is it this W2 innovation? Okay. At which horizons are these shocks priced? Okay. That will be important. And finally, through which channel? Okay. So do we get the pricing implication because W1 influences A or because W1 influences B? Okay. It turns out that the crucial object will be the interaction between these two channels. And this is where the, the correlation okay, will become really important. So when you think about the model that I just described, okay, there are two crucial outputs that we will use in our analysis. Okay? So first, so the model was described through a set of equations. Now we just solve the model using standard techniques. So we can stick the model actually to Dynair. This is what the authors do and just get the solution. We will be crucially interested in two objects that, that arise from this solution. Okay? The first object will be the cash flows that we want to price. Okay? So in particular, what we want to price is aggregate consumption or uh, cash flows that are the, the products of holding capital. Okay. We will use the generic letter G for all these cash flows that, that we will want to price. Okay. And then the second object that we will that will be of interest is the stochastic discount factor, because the stochastic discount factor will, will uh, determine the pricing. Okay. And we will use the generic letter S for the stochastic discount factor here. In general, how the solution will look like 
Well, the solution that we look for is a Markov solution. What does it mean? That there is a vector of state variables, x, okay, that I will leave unspecified for now. There is some vector of state variables. Okay? And we describe the, law, the equilibrium law of motion for this vector of state variable. Okay? So, so x will be the state variable. And all these cash flows and the stochastic discount factor okay, will be expressed in terms of growth rates, okay, so log gt plus 1 minus log gt will be the growth rate of the cash flow, okay, that will be stationary functions of x okay, and the shocks that, that hit the economy. Okay. And the same for the stochastic discount factor. The growth rate of the stochastic discount factor will be some stationary function, which we solve for, of x and the, and the shocks. Okay. So now let me actually go uh, to, uh, to the actual construction of the shock elasticity. I announced that I start with a simple one period, uh, one period pricing example. I know. will work with these growth rates as with these growth rates. Okay, this GT plus one. Let's log GT.
this thing. So, in the introduce a much more general framework. Okay, in the general so framework, the, the model okay, that you are using, we have in mind some for the vector state variable chapter, that will be Markov. So we will more we will have some Markov dynamics for this vector of state variable. And, more and we will model the objects of interest. Okay. As object that we call five uh, functions, and particularly these. I was wondering if if you okay, will have say take a model like I announced, uh, the one on the slide. by Christian okay. Moton of Stein. So these additive shows. functions. It would okay, be very interesting to know. A, we think about the economy as fundamental. What is the importance of those shocks in the price rate, of risk? Okay, that there is a crucial role for permanent shocks. So, okay, so you will that. have something like that. Well, what, what does it mean that? All these objects that are of our interest are non-stationary in the long run. Okay, but we will assume that these uh, objects do have stationary growth rates. As we accumulate these growth rates over time, we get non-stationary yeah. objects that we will call, that we will call these additive functionals. Okay, now these additive functionals will be used to model the stochastic growth, but also stochastic decay in terms of stochastic discounting. Right, in the case of the stochastic discount factor. Because they are additive, these, uh, these additive functionals, they'll be good for studying logarithms of quantity. So logarithms of cash flows, logarithms of stochastic say discount. You can have orthogonal shocks. In but in general, we are, analysis. in a surprising, interested in, in the okay. modeling of levels, right? Because it's not the expected logarithms of cash flows that we want to price. We want to price expected cash flow. So this is why we exponentiate. So we take these models. For, for additive functions, and then just exponentiate, okay? and we get what we call multiplicative functions. Right? The prototypical examples of these multiplicative functions that I already announced on the previous slide would be the stochastic discount factor and these cash flows. Okay? So one particular example of this okay. multiplicative functional M would be this S, and that would be a stochastic this discount same factor. Right, we have a mathematical yes, model. That would I'm come thinking about this other paper that. that model. Uh, of this type, okay. and similarly the cash flows G, with, okay, a, with the other types of these multiplicative of functions, course, uh, again mathematically uh, there will be models with these stationary uh, growth rates, and we obtain uh, and these models uh, with stationary uh, growth rates uh, from the solution matters. of the macroeconomic model. I, I guess, okay. I guess uh, so now, let me think their about approach the is different in the sense of the of one period cash flow G, and the, using the one and the process for the shock, no, they allow for time varying. What are GNS? Well, I model these GNS as, as models that have conditional mean, beta G. So there's the conditional growth rate of this cash flow, beta G. And conditional, uh, this beta G can depend on the, on, on the state of the economy in period zero. Okay, so there is state dependent. Okay, and can have also state dependent volatility. So this alpha G of X zero tells us the conditional volatility of this cash flow, because alpha g is this exposure to this shock vector w1. Okay? So think about w1 as a vector, as a normally distributed vector, okay? or a vector of normal distributed shocks. Okay? The stochastic discount factor will be another model, so it will have a conditional mean or a drift, beta s. So think about that as kind of the average discounting, and it will have an exposure to shocks that serves as the source of risk adjustments through this alpha. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to compute the one period return on this on, on an asset that pays off G1 in period one. Okay. What is this one period return? Well, it's the payoff tomorrow okay, divided by the price today. What is the price today? Well, the price today is just the expected discount. So, okay. So that's the expectation. Discounted by the S1, by the stochastic discount factor, cash flow. Right? So this is just an Euler equation for the price of this cash flow today in period zero. So this is the, the return. I can take this return and I can compute the logarithm of the expected return. Uh, when I compute the logarithm of the expected return, okay, what do I get? It's very interesting. Well, it's just the logarithm of expected many, payoff. Many of okay? Of divided course, by the logarithm of the we'll price. We'll take a careful look at the, the denominator of, uh, in the, this equation. The tools that you are writing. So conditionally Gaussian framework, 
okay. I can actually compute everything in Cosmos. And Papa is minus the beta x. I open the microphone x, for everyone, okay. so if okay. anyone wants this to ask something term. or... This together, these two terms together, right. there will be the risk Check field. Window, okay. The last term in red so is minus alpha d times alpha l. This, this is, is the so-called really, risk really premium. Interesting. <laughs> and the risk premium depends on two things. First, it depends on alpha d, okay? that the exposure of so, this cash flow to uh, risk, how risky okay, this cash you, flow you, is. You already mentioned that. And uh, minus you alpha s say is the you have price a of it. Right? There's the volatility of the stochastic discount. Stern. And minus alpha s uh, is called in this pricing literature the price of risk. What does this price of risk represent? Yeah, it's minus alpha f represents because How much compensation there has to be per one unit of this exposure? Yeah. Uh, so you don't have these models. The expected on return. Monetary policy and risk okay. premium. So uh, that the representative investor wants to hold this. Right. So, so the equilibrium guy. compensation of the investor Perhaps. for holding this risk is minus alpha. Okay. And the risk premium is the product of this. Yeah. Okay. And we know the standard asset pricing puzzles from the literature involve the fact. That the magnitude of this uh, of this alpha s is typically too small okay, for plausible levels of risk coverage. That's the standard Mehra Prescott puzzle. So what do you need to do? Well, you need to increase this alpha s. You need to increase this volatility of this stochastic discount factor. And this goes back to the specification of the of the preferences in that Icrochelli model. Why did we use these Epstein's in preferences? Because the last term in the Epstein's in preferences really magnified the volatility of the stochastic discount factor. Okay, so it's just a side note. Okay, the key takeaway here is the risk premium minus alpha s times alpha d, as composed of these two, uh, as, uh, as being the product of these two components, alpha d and minus alpha s. Okay. So now what I want to do is, I want to construct this result in a different way, and this goes now to the construction of some elasticity that I have in mind. Okay. So what I want to do now is, I want to construct an alternative way. How to back out from equilibrium return, okay, these objects alpha g and minus alpha s. And here I could introduce the notion of so called perturbation. Okay. So, what is a perturbation? A perturbation here will be a random variable, a perturbation will be here a random variable h1 okay, that is scaled by a scalar parameter r. And I will get back to the scalar parameter r. How is this h1 model? Forget about the first term. The first term is and, and this same Let's focus type of on the second one. Machinery that you are using. The second on, one on the, tells us what is the exposure of this perturbation I was thinking of, H1. For example, the, the work on. Okay. In particular, the, this exposure is R of the one that the vector alpha H. The Francois this vector alpha H tells the us pricing of these rare to which shocks in this vector W1 Again, okay, are perturbations. Again, this same machinery can be. So the simplest example is to think about alpha H as being a vector of okay. zeros with a single one in a particular component, right? Then this alpha H would pick up the exposure to a single component in this vector W1, okay? So when you think about W1 as containing different shocks, so think about the productivity shock, uh, the investment specific shock, some demand shocks, etc. okay, some financial shocks, okay? This alpha H will pick up one of these shocks, one of these innovations. Okay. And then we can construct alternative alpha H to understand the implications for alternative elements of this vector W1. Okay. The scalar parameter R just scales the magnitude of this vector. Okay. And what we will be interested in are small perturbations. So we will be interested in studying what happens when R goes to zero. So what do we want to do now with this H, with this H1? Uh, we want to create an alternative cash flow okay, that, that, will have, that will be differentially exposed to risk. So in particular, I will want to take the original cash flow, G1, okay, or log G1, and I want to add to it this log H1. Okay. What, so now I have a new cash flow, okay, G1 times H1R. Okay. So that's a hypothetical cash flow in this economy. What is, again, these first two terms are not important. Let's focus on the last one. What, what is this term? Well, this term tells me, this bracket tells me, how is this new cash flow exposed to this shock vector W1? Now we know that, now we see that we have the original exposure, alpha D, 
Okay? And now we have this new exposure added to it, R times alpha H. Okay? So this new cash flow, G1 times H1R, is now differentially more exposed to risk. Okay? This is the new, the new risk exposure. Okay? And different R's give us different cash flows, G1, H1R. Okay? And I can compute the expected returns on all these cash flows. Okay? So let me do that. So what I can what can I do? I can take this cash flow G1 H1R and I can compute the expected return on this cash flow. Remember, this is the log expected payoff minus the log price. Exactly the same computation as a couple of slides ago. Okay. But now I have expected returns for all these possible R's. Okay. But so what I want to do is I want to study what happens to this expected return to this to this whole line. Okay. Uh, when I change R so a little bit. And we How have a, well, I just differentiate with respect to R. Would right. like so to what do I do? I study the sensitivity of this experiment with respect to R. Uh, we'll but be, it turns we'll out that I can actually do it in post form in this very simple model. So, that, uh, we can yeah. upload it so what do I get? The okay. so, more people so let me first differentiate the first term. So this lock thank you to you. Thank you to Santiago. What do I get? I will get an Mexico object that, that I will call the shock the connection exposure to output. make this seminar okay. possible and thank you. For Remember, this first the, term is the expected the payoff attending. of this new cash flow. So the, what this expo shock thank exposure you. elasticity measures, okay, right. it measures the sensitivity of 